So thank you everyone for coming on today for our student, our PA student live Q&A with University of Toronto PA students Hannah and Marie Christine. So I'm Anne, I'm a Canadian certified PA working in orthopedic surgery in Toronto. I'll be the one moderating today's Q&A. And this is Hannah. Yeah, so my name is Hannah. Um, you can follow me on Instagram through Hannah the PA. I'm a first year U of T student um, and I did my undergrad at Trinity Western University in British Columbia in biology. And then I um, did my master's at Queen's in aging and health. And now I'm in school at first year U of T. We just finished our second semester and we're on our first week break um, between semesters, which is so, so nice. <laughs> and uh, next we have MC or Marie Christine. So my name is Mary Christine, or MC, and uh, I'm also a first year student U of T. Uh, my background is a bit diverse. So I have a degree in electrophysiology. So basically uh, doing exams that are related to the human body's electrical system. Um, I did my undergrad in health sciences at Queens, and uh, I'm also a professional photographer. And uh, yeah, my handle is Frenchie the PAS, because I'm francophone. Everything that you'll be hearing about today uh, will be on for a replay. You can find all the official up-to-date information from University of Toronto's uh, website, paconsortium.ca. You can also find information about uh, U of T PA resources. Uh, there's a couple of sites you can go to. So there are going to be four parts to our uh, live today. We're going to cover the pre-PA journey, experience in PA school, applying to PA school, and reapplying to PA school. So let's dive in. Uh, part one, questions on your pre-PA journey. So uh, why did you choose to become a PA? So um, I chose to become a PA because um, there's multiple different reasons. As primarily, I always had an interest in working um, and studying medicine. Uh, and initially I thought the only route to complete that was a um, MD, a medical degree. So initially I was studying to apply to medical school. I wrote the MCAT, applied to medical school um, in my third year of undergrad, and I was not accepted that round and I was readying my application another cycle. Um, and then a family friend introduced me to the PA profession and I was quite interested in it um, due to the flexibility of the career, the ability to be able to practice medicine in multiple specialties, to grow as a professional that way, um, otherwise known as the lateral mobility of their profession. I thought that was quite neat. Um, I was also interested in just uh, the extension that you provide uh, with your supervising physicians. It's very much a collaborative role, which was very interesting to me. Um, the ability to kind of work alongside your supervising physician and in collaboration with the team uh, is something that was really of interest to me as opposed to um, the MD route where you're kind of the sole provider on a case. So that was a, a strong distinction that made me more interested in, in the PA path. And then the last kind of reason was the overarching goal of, a P, of the PA profession is to extend healthcare services um, and really fill gaps within the healthcare system, whether that be patient education through longer visits, um, just a, a different kind of post-op, pre-op care. There's so many different roles that PAs play within our uh, healthcare system and even uh, northern and rural care as well. So those three aspects really drew me to the profession. And so um, I ended up applying and here I am. So I like I was already in healthcare, like I said earlier, I, I was a technologist working in healthcare and I really love, you know, working with patients and I, I love like talking with them and reassuring them. So that was like a huge aspect that always like drew me to healthcare. Uh, I personally have like my own journey as a patient. So I actually got treated by a PA and I remember the PA walked in and she was like, hi, I'm a PA. And I was like, what is a PA? I had no idea. And when she told me about her job, I was like, wow, this is like the dream profession. And immediately, like I started researching and, and this is, this was in the US actually. Um, so when I came home, I, I actually looked it up and found out that we actually had this in Canada as well. And I, I was blown away and I started the process. I actually didn't even have an undergrad at that point. I had a college degree. So I actually enrolled in undergrad to get the process started. Um, and I was really drawn by like, kind of like what Hannah was saying, like the lateral mobility for us to be able to change, you know, like, 
fields if we wanted to. Um, I really like the fact that we get to spot and spend a lot of time with the patient. That's like sometimes, you know, like as a physician, sometimes they might be a bit in, more in a hurry. Not always, like it's, it's not always like that. But as PAs, it's one thing that we do have that oftentimes we can really be there and advocate for patients. And personally, I really love the fact that the profession is fairly new. It's new-ish. Um, and the fact that I could advocate for this profession and help it grow in the country to me was like, it was just really exciting. Um, like it's not that established. To have, so to have a role um, to kind of pave the way, I, I just found that really like intriguing and exciting. So those are like main reasons why I found PA really interesting and attracting to me. All right. So what do you think helped you stand out on your PA application? Um, so some of the things that I think helped me stand out on my PA school application, um, the first being that I took a lot of time to self-reflect before I decided to pursue uh, the PA profession in general, because as I initially said, I was really set on um, pursuing medical school to become a physician. And I had to make a bit of a mental shift when I found out about uh, the career of a physician assistant. I was really interested, but I knew because I had been working towards um become a physician for so long, it took a bit of a, a mental shift to get my mind behind, okay, this is what I'm doing now, even though I knew it was the what I wanted because it aligned so well with my career goals. So I think that helped me stand out as a candidate because I had done um, the groundwork of thinking, why would I wanna be a physician assistant as compared to a physician? What draws me to the profession? And who am I as a person? Like, What strengths do I have that would make me a good candidate as a PA? And going through that process of reflecting it and thinking about experiences that I had that were very um, satisfying, like where I found joy through my work and different experiences, being able to, draw on those experiences and really help those solidify my reason behind why I wanna be a PA, I think helped me stand out. And also um, my own understanding of my own career goals and what I wanna achieve as a PA and as um, a uh, practicing PA in the future, my interest in continuing research and potentially teaching. So all these other goals, I had these um, laid out for myself. And so I think that confidence and that self-assurance and what I wanted out of a career and how that could be so uh, well um, kind of achieved through this profession and through this specific program that that allowed me to be a strong candidate as I was applying. So for me, um, what made me stand out? So I, I think it's a, it's always like a mix up of things. And sometimes, you know, people like reach out to me on Instagram and they're like, what one thing do I need to do? It's not really one thing. I, I think you really have to bring like several things together to make yourself stand out. I know that for me, like a big point was the fact that I had a lot of healthcare um, experience. So just because I've been practicing as a, as a technologist for 10 something years. So I had like 15,000 hours of direct patient care. So for me, that was huge. And I was able to also work in different fields. So I did some cardiology, some neurology, physiatry. So the fact that I touch on different, you know, uh, fields in medicine, different populations, um, and really that hands-on experience, that was something that I really focused on in my application. Uh, I think that that is something that helped, you know, maybe help, help me stand out. Um, and again, I really talked about my patient experience and I, I am not saying that, you know, if you have a patient experience, you have to talk about it. But for me, um, like my patient experience, like I, I had like many hip surgeries and it's something that's really a big part of who I am and I'm not shy to talk about it. So I actually did mention it in my application, um, you know, about like the actual struggle um, and how it, like what it meant to have a good provider and how I understand like what it means to be on that on that side, on that perspective where you're sitting on that exam you know, table or chair or whatever. Um, I, I know how that feels. So I did talk about that because I think that, you know, it did, you know, although it was a hard part of my life, it did shape me into who I am today, but also makes me understand how a patient can feel. So I really I focused, those are like the big points that I focused on. Um, so yeah, my patient experience and my experience as a healthcare provider as well. Excellent. And what were your pre-PA candidate stats? So understanding a little bit of your background before you applied to PA school. Yeah, so I was 23 at the time of applying. I started PA school at 24. Um, I applied once to both programs um, in Ontario, so McMaster and U of T. Um, I was um, 
interviewed at both and accepted at both programs. And I had my undergrad GPA, that's what the UG GPA is, is at 3.78. I did also complete a master's in aging and health at Queens uh, directly after my undergrad. And then I got more than 910 hours, but at the time 910 was the requirement um, for U of T. And I got those as a medical receptionist working at a family practice. So I did that. I worked while I was completing my master's and then the year that I also applied to PA school. Um, and then those are my degrees at the bottom. So those were kind of my statistics uh, as I applied. And my undergrad was in biology. So yeah, for me, uh, my first degree was again, uh, electrophysiology technologist. So that's a college degree. Um, so it doesn't count. So I know that sometimes people ask about that, like does a college degree count? And unfortunately it doesn't, but um, I was able to get some transfer credits from my college degree and apply it to university. So I was able to get some electives actually credited um, when I started my undergrad. Uh, so I have that. I also have a degree in photography. Uh, that I couldn't transfer any credits for photography into healthcare. Um, and then, yeah, like I said earlier, I did undergrad in health sciences at Queens. Um, so I, my GPA is approximate. It's like 3.7-ish. Uh, it's hard because at Queens it's on a 4.3 scale. So it was kind of based on what I calculated using like the calculators on Google or whatever. Um, and uh, again, like yeah, 10,000, 15,000 hours. And uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm forgetting anything at this point, Anne or Hannah, you can mention if I'm leaving things behind. No worries. Uh, actually, it looks like from your infographic, there's a huge variety of different backgrounds that people come with for healthcare experience. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the backgrounds that some of your classmates are from? Yeah, so we have like a really, like you can see on the screen here, a really big variety of, of professions and, and jobs. So uh, we have a few kinesiologists or like they worked in kinesiology, have athletic therapy. Um, uh, one, one is in like psychology. Um, what else do we have? It's a, a radiation, um, like, yeah, a radiation technology. I don't know how you call that more specifically. Uh, what else, Hannah? I'm, I'm forgetting things. They're, they're right there, actually. I should just look at them. Yeah, a lot of um, medical assistants or like pharmacy assistants as well. So kind of administrative roles and then some research, uh, clinical research as well that I think uh, people completed through their undergrad um, or through their master's as well. Excellent. Yeah, and it's really cool because like just quickly, like in our class, because we have such a diverse background, like everyone has kind of like a health background because of the hours that we need to apply. But, you know, in all our different courses, like different classmates will have strengths at different times. So you can really help each other. Um, like for example, we just finished like ECG and I worked in cardiology, so I was able to help out. And then if we're doing psych, like another classmate is able to help. I'm sure Hannah will help when we get to like geriatrics. Um, I think it's next semester. So it's really nice to have that diverse background for, throughout all our classmates. Yeah, I'm see was a lifesaver holding the tutorials for me for the <laughs> Oh, so good. All right, so let's move on to part two, which is questions about U of T's PA program. Why did you choose to attend the University of Toronto's PA program? So there are kind of, I should say, the three main reasons why I chose to apply to U of T's PA program. The first being I liked that it was distributed online mostly. I had done my master's online previously. Initially, I was a bit hesitant moving to an online platform. This is obviously before COVID where everybody has to get comfortable with online platforms, but um, because I was unsure that I would be able to have the same self-discipline without being surrounded by my classmates. But having been able to complete that successfully through my master's, I felt really comfortable going into that through the U of T program. So I liked that there was the opportunity to be in person through the intensive campus blocks, but then also to do kind of work on your own at home. And that just allowed also for some saving by being at home as opposing to have to relocate. So that was a major factor for me at the time. And then the second one being that U of T has a real focus on providing care to those in rural and underserved areas. And that's a passion of mine in providing care. So actually you are able to complete half of your core rotations in Northern Ontario, or if you're from up North, that'd be the Southern Ontario. So swapping um, where you are. And so that was really of interest to me because I wanted to get experience um, completing clinical rotations in rural areas um, and just 
working with different patient demographics because I think that would really uh, develop me as a care provider. So that was the second main reason. And then the third just being that I could rotate in those different areas. So those kind of three main reasons were why I was really drawn to the U of T program. I actually am a second time applicant. So I did apply once um, when I was at the like mid part of my second year or even like early second year, I had completed the two years. I applied and I didn't get an interview, I only applied to U of T, didn't get an interview. So I reapplied the year after both U of T and Mac. I got an interview with both and I got accepted into U of T. So it turned out well, because that's actually the school I wanted to attend. Um, also, like kind of said, I really like the fact that, um, you know, the first year was mostly online that I'd be able, so I'm in Quebec. So for me, that was a huge thing to be able to stay home for the first year and study from home uh, and not have to relocate and like, you know, like kind of said, like get an apartment and lose my family and stuff. So that was nice. I really like the more traditional aspect of learning. So we have like the more like classic courses of like anatomy, physiology, pathology, um, you know, like more structured, like really like in undergrad type courses. And I work well in that where I need the structure to kind of guide me through. I just, my brain works better that way. But we also do have like a part that's uh, problem-based learning, which is like the main focus, I think like at Mac, for example. So we do touch on EPBL, it's it's online. So um, I really like that it was a mix of EPBL where it's more like kind of free and like more, it's like less guided and you have to kind of pave your own way. Uh, so we did have that, but also the mix with the more traditional, that was a really big point. And also like Hannah said, like the really, the, the mission to me really spoke to me. And I always said that like people who re reach out to me, like, oh, what should I do? Like before an interview, I'm like, well, you need to know why you're applying to these schools. You're not just applying because you want to be a PA. Like it has to be kind of like a job. You're not just going to randomly apply at a job and just, they're gonna say like, why are you applying here? And you're like, oh, I want a job. Like, they'd be like, no, we're not gonna hire you. So I really looked up the mission and to me, like the underserved communities, you know, like um, and rural people who don't have access. And like, for me being Francophone, like I know in like Northern Ontario, for example, there's a lot of Francophone patients um, who don't have access to a Francophone provider. Uh, so that really spoke to me. And I'm actually hoping that I do get to have a placement in, you know, Northern Ontario, somewhere where we, we speak French and I can walk in and use my French. Like that's something I really want to do. So those are like the main points why like UT for me was perfect. And can you briefly describe how first year of PA school is delivered at U of T? Yeah, so first year PA school, as we kind of both mentioned, is a good portion is online. So it's a mix of intensive online learning and then campus blocks where everybody comes together for a couple weeks and it's really, really intense. You're every day um, learning something new. Um, in groups and you're practicing those hands-on clinical skills. So such as physical exam skills, um, procedure skills and uh, things that can be observed and tested as well. And so also some patient history taking. So those are kind of the things that you learn together as an intense uh, campus block. And then the rest of the program is distributed online. So you have courses each semester that change up. Some of them are continuing, some of them are just for the semester and you every week get uh, distributed new information to work through on your own. And then there's also some scheduled class time in addition to some group work. So either is sometimes some group assignments. And then also we have, as MC mentioned, EPBL, so Electronical Problem-Based uh, Learning. So that's uh, once a week, these sessions in a group where we have a new patient case every two weeks. And it's a, it's a virtual patient that we ask questions, we gain information, and we, we work through the case together. And we talk about different aspects, and then we're expected to have different uh, outcomes, like learning objectives, the second week that we work through. So if the topic was on, on one um, major kind of condition that the patient had, then that next week, we're really diving into the, the epidemiology, the path physiology, the management plan, treatment, uh, pharmacotherapy. So that's EPBL. And then um, we have our other courses as well that we go through. Um, and as I mentioned, some of them have tutorials, some of them have formal classes, but a lot of it, a lot of it is just personal um, working through the information on your own. So you have to be quite self-disciplined to do that, um, but it's so fast paced that you have um, no uh, option but to study. So. <laughs> And also what's cool quickly is that a lot, a lot of times our courses, like, although like, for example, this semester we had like pathology, EPBL, um, I don't even remember at this point, like pharmacology or whatever, oftentimes they kind of, they made it in a way where it kind of crosses over. So if we're like, for example, in pathology, we're talking about genetics. 
then an EPBL, like we had, like our patient was a, a baby with Down syndrome. So it kind of mixes everything up together. So it really solidifies like the learning that you did throughout all your courses. And with that being said, what is the best way to stay on track and know that you are not falling behind in an online delivery model? It's a great question. So I, yeah, it's really, it's, it's something that it's, it's it's something you, you, you kind of have to be flexible because it does change over time. And that's something that I saw like compared to undergrad, I had one study method. I did one thing the whole time and it kind of worked for me. So I did it, but PA school is like, it's all about adjusting. And like one course, if you do one style for one course, it might not work for another course. It's really adapting um, for me. And I did my undergrad in online as well. So kind of like Hannah and her master's, I think um, when you're doing online learning, it's really about staying organized so for me I like that I like really I have to-do lists I have my agenda my paper agenda my you know calendar my computer um it's really staying organized so the way I did it was like on Sunday evening for example I would uh, open up my calendar and our all our courses are there so I would write in my agenda all the courses we had I would quickly go through like to see like okay how many lectures do we have this week uh let's say in Patha we would have 15 for two weeks I say okay my objective is to do nine for this week and I write down everything. Um, and this way I have like a big to-do list for the whole week. And then I plan day, day by day um, and kind of check it off. It's really satisfying every time you get it done. Um, so yeah, just like really like always looking into the, the course like background to see like what's happening, what's due when, when's your next exam. Like I even have like a wall calendar with like a full month where I have all my exams because they come really quickly. So to have a visual, I'm like, okay, it's coming actually two weeks. I had to start prepping for that. So it's like, really managing your time and really staying organized for me was like the biggest thing on on um, getting things done on online learning. Yeah, organization is so important for online classes. And I think it's nice because the program does release material at incremental time. So I think that's a good benchmark even, even amongst that because you know kind of where you should be at. I do find that students who are in the PA program in general, like we're pretty strong students. So I think if anything, sometimes it's a little too much pressure on yourself and how much to get done in a day. So I think there's a balance between um, wanting to get through everything and then being gracious with yourself um, with how much material there is and how much you need to learn in a short period of time. So I'm thankful for classmates that also help us keep each other on track. And um, it's, it's really great. Before we jump into second year, I think maybe some people want to know like how things are going on, the fact that we're in a pandemic, which is really crazy. Um, so usually how U of T is delivered is that you have your first year is mostly online, but then you have several uh, in-person blocks. But because of the pandemic, that kind of changed. So usually we'd have, for example, a one month block in September, then we'd have, I think, another in like December and then April or May and we'll be like several but because of the pandemic, we just couldn't go as often, but it's really cool because our program really modified and adapted. So they kind of condensed it. So uh, for example, we were in there in September, two weeks intensive, like what time was it? I don't remember, like eight to six nonstop. And we had to study from what, what the moment we got home to when we went to bed, um, really intensive. Um, so we do have a little, little less like in person, but I, I think like we're, they're really doing the best they can. And I, I don't think we'll be penalized. Like I think we'll be able to catch up once we enter second year. So that's a difference. We also usually have um, LCEs, which are longitudinal uh, clinical experiences, where we kind of go into clinic, I think it's half day a week, that's usually what how the program works. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we were not able to do that just because, um, you know, to keep patients safe, to keep us safe. And also, you know, for, so the providers can really focus on working because everyone like Anne are doing an amazing job but working in the pandemic and we don't want to like burden them with our presence or anything. So we don't have that. So we kind of modified it and had it online instead. But the good news is, segue into this, is that second year is not affected um, by the pandemic for us. And like currently the second years are um, having their placements. So basically we have, I think it's eight placements throughout the whole year of four weeks uh, usually, so it's like family med, internal med, surgery, yeah, emergency, pediatrics, uh, psych psychiatry, um, I'm forgetting some, I think, right now, but you basically rotate through them. Um, and like Hannah said earlier, you can kind of do um, part of it in your hometown. So like, in the, for example, if you live in Toronto, you do half in Toronto, and then you can ask and have the second half um, up north. So it can be anywhere up north, like North Bay or Thunder Bay or, or whatever. Um, and your electives too, you can think about what you'd like to do those in because you get two elective rotations as well. So um, those usually come at the end of your second year. Uh, so you go through those ones first and then 
Um, the order of the rotations are not set in stone from my understanding. They can change up a little bit. So, uh, but it's really exciting second year because you finally get to actually see and practice what you've been learning all that time. So I think it'll really solidify what we've been learning and make it seem a little bit more tangible when we can actually apply it to patient settings. And how are you graded in PA school? Is it pass fail if you get percentages? So we are given percentages in most of our classes. Some of them are more just kind of like you've done the assignment. Um, so just kind of like a check mark. But the majority of our classes are percentage graded and you are required to kind of uh, get a 70% on the assignments or else you have to do extra work to kind of catch up on that material. So the program does really want to see all the students succeed because they know that getting to PA school is extremely difficult and it's uh, you've shown academic excellence to get to the program and they know that you're strong students and they know it's a lot of material to learn as well. So they really wanna support you through that entire process. There's academic supports available. The class environment is no longer competitive because your classmates are working together, sharing notes, having online Jeopardy sessions to study together. So it, it's very, um, it's a, it's a nice environment. It's a, a big change from undergrad when everybody's just working towards that professional degree to get the high GPAs and apply to those programs. So I think that's, a, that's something that's really special and cool about PA school. Yeah, and I would also add quickly, like I know like Hannah was saying like in undergrad, like I would want to always have like A plus, like, you know, 95 and more if I can, 90, because you are thinking about that GPA because if you are applying to PA school, you know, it's competitive or if you're thinking about med school, you know, it's competitive. But once you're in PA school, like for me anyways, like PA school for me is the end game. Like that's what I want to do. So my GPA, like we're all, I don't think we're gunners though. I think we're, we're all like, we're like high, we all strive to get really good grade just because that's how we're programmed. But at the same time, it doesn't matter. Like grades don't really matter like for your like your file anymore. It's more that you want to absorb the information so you can use it later on with your patients. Like that's what matters now. So it's a nice shift. I find like before you're like, oh, you need that number. But now it's like, do I understand the content? Because I'll be using it later. And how hard is PA school uh, based on your experience so far? Uh, what's been the most difficult part? So I'd say PA school is, is really hard, but it's also not hard because you love everything that you're learning. At least that's how I, my experience has been. So I feel like in undergrad, some classes were so hard because you didn't want, you weren't interested in the materials. So that's what made them hard. But PA school is hard because of the volume of information that you have to learn within such a short time. And especially if you don't have macro knowledge in certain areas, you're having to, lot, to do a lot of learning. So for example, at U of T, we are required to take anatomy in our first semester. And in my undergrad, I had not taken anatomy before. So it was a big learning curve to me to go through so much in such a short time. Similarly with physiology, I think our instructor said that we were going through like a year's worth of material in just a few short months. So um, it's very fast paced. But like I said, because the environment is so supportive and encouraging, that is so different than undergrad when you're kind of looking at your neighbor and comparing marks, at least that was my experience, um, then it's, it's very different because you just want to know the materials so you can serve your patients um, to the best of your ability and just become the best provider that you can be. So that would be my take on how hard PA school is. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's, it's really intense. Like, and it's funny because like you always hear that. Like I remember as a pre-PA, I would hear students say like, it's really, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. But you don't really get it until you're actually in it. Um, but um, I think it really changes to like the type of difficulty. I find first semester, for example, was super hard because everything is new. Like the way it's delivered is just the volume. You're not used to it. And then like your study methods are from undergrad are no longer, most of, most of the time not, you can't use them anymore. So you have to change your study methods find what's working for you. Like for me and Hannah actually was, was Anki and like the, the, like the cue cards, but then you have to learn how Anki works, but then everything is still keeping going. So it's really adapting. So like, for me, that was difficult. Like in first semester, I personally kind of forgot what self-care was. Like I, I stopped working out. I stopped care. I ate, like I gained a lot of weight. <laughs> so it's like stress eating and whatever. So that was really hard. But by the time we were finished with first semester, I had my groove in terms of like study methods. So once we entered second semester, that was something that I was behind me and I was like much more comfortable. I was able to reintegrate like working out and like, you know, being more mindful about what I'm eating. Uh, but then the difficulty, like the, the content we're learning, that's harder. 
So it's, it's funny. It's a weird, like things are, are difficult in different ways. Um, but it's just, I, it feels like keeping an open mind and um, like kind of said earlier, like not forget, um, you know, to, to, to care about yourself and, and uh, not get lost in like just thinking about school. That's also very important to me. Yeah, I love what you said, MC, flexibility. I think as a student, that's like so important, the ability to be flexible in different learning environments. And I, I think it really helps with your success as a student. And do you think it's possible to work well in PA school, given the volume of the workload, uh, especially in first year? Yeah, so MC probably has a bit more to share on this. I did not work in PA school. I initially had thought that I'd continue working a few hours at the clinic. Uh, but then when I saw that the program itself advised kind of against working, I was like, okay, it's probably serious. I probably should not work while I'm doing PA school. And I really just wanted to focus on my studies. So I decided not to continue working. And I'm pretty happy with that decision. And it has allowed me to hold some extracurricular activities on the side, um, which if I think if I was working, then I wouldn't be able to do anything except school and work. So I'm glad and I'm happy that I made that decision. Yeah, so our school does, um, you know, recommend that we don't work. And that's something that they always say when once you enter, they, they prefer why we don't work. Um, some students do work. I actually started last semester working one day a week. And it was like a short day. It's not even like, it was, I think like, five or six hours I'm like oh like that's fine but I ended up being so overwhelmed because like I said earlier everything changes the content it's super heavy and I just got so stressed and I found that I, I didn't have leverage anymore for like self-care kind of what like Hannah was saying like she wants to use that free time for stuff that she likes and I was just using that time to work and it kind of sucked so I actually ended up uh, taking a small break from working um, during first semester. So I ended up not working at all. Uh, but I then in winter semester, I kind of missed being with patients. And especially that we're online so much, it's like in front of our computer screens and I'm like a social person. I need to talk and like interact with people. And I was really missing that. It was actually weighing like really heavy on me. So I actually decided to kind of go back to work, but very, very minimally. So I only worked like two half days per month which is nothing um but like for me that's enough because it, it, it like it does bring in a little money it, it helps me interact with patients but it doesn't impact you know my schoolwork and I still am able to have time for myself um and you know like I kind of said like for extra uh, curricular activities but we do have some classmates that work more I don't know how they do it like some people work like two weekends a month or three weekends a month or even like two times a week I personally would not be able to do that just because of the I don't know how they do it Kudos to them, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, I don't know how they do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what do you believe makes a strong candidate for U of T's PA program? At least um, my understanding is that to be a strong candidate, you have a good understanding of yourself and why you want to be a PA. And then also you have a good understanding of the program and why you'd be a good fit for that specific program. I think those are really two key aspects that will help um, you stand out as a candidate because it shows that you're invested in the profession, that this is really what you want. And it also shows that you're invested in the program and that the program and you would be a good fit. So I think those are two really key core aspects that uh, are good things to reflect on if you haven't already. And because even uh, as you continue on with your education and you become a PA, you'll learn that you are going to be describing your role as a physician assistant more often than, than not. So it's important for you to have a good understanding of what a PA is before you even pursue the profession. So when your family members ask you, oh, you're going to be a PA, what is that? Then you have the answer right on the tip of your tongue and you're able to explain it and you are confident that this is what you want to go after because there are so few spots in the programs like they're so small a, a program and the programs really invest in their students so they want to see that this is really where you want to be and it's not necessarily a stepping stone to something else not that you can't have other aspirations as well but that you're really invested um i would also add i kind of said this earlier but Oftentimes people are like, what one thing can I do to stand out? But I really, again, looking back at our class, um, like our, our stats, everyone has such a diverse background in terms of school, but also like, you know, extracurricular activities, like, um, you know, some work as a medic in the army and, and not even just work like in general as well. So I think when you're, you know, you're talking about yourself uh, in your supplemental application or in the interview, it's important that you show like, different aspects that makes you unique that makes you you like for me it was the healthcare experience the fact that I'm a patient 
you know, I did talk about, for example, the fact that I went to Haiti to do some volunteering, like that's something that I have that maybe other people don't have. So sometimes people say like, oh, I'm only like 21 or 22. I didn't do much. I'm like, I'm sure you did something. Like, did you like you do sports in high school? Like, what did that teach you? Like, for sure, those gave you some like really important lessons and being disciplined, like mixing school and sports and, and teamwork and all that. So really, I think what's important is to sit down and really think about who you are and how we can really showcase that. Because when you're, you know, if you're talking to the program, like, yes, you want a spot to be in the program, but they're also looking for someone that's special to be in that spot. So really show how diverse you are, what you can bring as a person um, and as a classmate to other people as well. And also think that they're looking to who would be a good PA in the future. So that's a good thing to keep in mind as well. So moving on to part three, applying to University of Toronto's PA program. So can one of you summarize, what are the prerequisites to get into University of Toronto's PA program? You need, you have to be a Canadian citizen, first thing, or I think permanent resident as well. Um, you need to have a minimum of two years of undergrad. So it's the 10 full year, like 20 credits, half year. Um, that's really the minimum, a minimum GPA 2.7. And uh, so it used to be 900 hours for the healthcare experience, but because of COVID, they actually drop that to 100 for this cycle that just closed. And also I think for next year as well. So that's really good. Like if you don't have healthcare experience, like it's possible to get 100 hours uh, in one year. So that's a good thing. So those are things you really have to have to apply. If you don't have those, you're like your application won't, won't be looked at. It'll be, it will be rejected. And then we have uh, the recommended criteria. So for example, you'll have like anatomy, physiology, and chemistry. Um, they usually uh, suggest having a full, like a full course like two semesters basically of each of those courses. Um, I think they also suggest that you have like direct patient care versus like indirect, but those are recommendations. So it's not things that you have to have um, to apply, but it's just a plus for you. And I think like sometimes I see like on the Facebook group, people are asking like, oh, like, should I, do I have to take like chemistry? Do I have to take, you know, those recommended courses? And what I feel, I'm not speaking for the program, but what I feel is that this, first of all, can give you a plus because you do have those courses, you know, in your transcript. Um, but it's especially for when you're thinking if you are accepted into PA school, like having that anatomy background and having that physiology background will help you because you will have that base already there. So you'll kind of build on that. Um, because if you have, if you don't have those courses, like you can learn it, like many people like can, I think you're saying like anatomy, you didn't have that. And you did great. But it's just, it's a bit easier when you have kept on that before. So that's just, it, it's helpful for your app, but also for your future as a student. How does University of Toronto calculate GPA for PA admissions? But I believe it's a cumulative GPA. So no matter kind of when you did your undergraduate degree, the GPA is considered cumulative from that. And so um, also like I did my master's program and I did actually get a GPA for my master's. Some master's you don't get a GPA from, um, but the GPA for the master's is not considered. It's just kind of considered that you have a, a master's and they would consider that in your application as like a separate kind of part of you as an applicant. Healthcare experience hours are required for U of T. Um, what are examples of healthcare experience hours and do they consider some types of hours more competitive than others? So I got my hours as a medical assistant, um, working as a family practice office. It was also a partial walk-in. I know a lot of students in our, not a lot, but a few other students yeah. in our program also got them that way. I think it's a really great position if you're someone who doesn't have a previous um, certification, like, like MC got previous certification to do something a bit more specialized. So if you don't, I think medical assistant is a great option. I also got exposed to a lot of different, um, I got exposed to primary medicine, but I got exposed to special because I was um, coordinating referrals. And so I learned quite a bit of just about how the medical system works, which I think is really important when you're going through an accelerated program. If you've never been introduced to the medical system in Canada, I would suggest doing something where you get exposed to that. Mind you, you can do something that's a little bit more indirect, such as clinical research, uh, and you may still be interacting with patients as well. So there's a very wide spectrum, but I think MC touched on this before that direct patient interaction is think a uh, key like that's gold if you can get it but sometimes it's not always possible so um, whatever you have to get is great and if you're ever confused I've had a lot of students message me does this count does this count message the admissions committee they're super great at responding really quick and they'll give you um, information regarding that and then you won't have to worry or or do it and then find out it doesn't count so you can always always contact them kind of what you're saying like about the indirect patient care like I know sometimes people message me and they're like oh, I got like a volunteer position doing this. 
do you think that's enough for me to get in? And like, I always say like, it's again, it's not one element in your application. Like, yes, maybe a direct position will have more value per se, but at the same time, what else can you offer? And like, if you, if you did other things in your life, like do talk about that, because again, that will raise you up and separate you from everyone else. So it's not only about the job that you hold or volunteer position that you have. And what is the PA supplemental application? If you were to summarize what this, and do you have any tips or approaches to writing this effectively and well? Yeah, so the PA supplemental application is just the first kind of part of the U of T application. So there's a few questions online. They should be, I think they are available year round. You can see the previous years online. Um, I could be mistaken, but I think for our years, they were available online. So you can get a sense of kind of what the questions are that are being asked. And then you have to prepare kind of a written response that you submit with your initial application. And so I think some, some keys to accelerating and ex, sorry, excelling, not accelerating in that portion of the application would be to engage in some of the activities that we discussed before. So self-reflection, thinking about uh, things that uh, maybe extracurriculars, jobs, volunteers, or just maybe even personal life experiences, all things that uh, can help you answer those responses, things that can get you thinking about yourself and who you are as a person in order to answer those questions well. Uh, so obviously not sure how those are kind of considered, but just in general, those are kind of some processes that really helped me approach the application. And if you can like get somebody to have a second eyes to look at it, I think that was helpful for me. I tried to get a couple different family members to look at it um, because I appreciated kind of their different perspectives, what they had to bring to my application. Like my sister is a dietitian, so she had a, a viewpoint. And then my mom working in education, she had a different perspective to bring. So I think those different perspectives just helped me in my own personal writing. Um, in reflecting on what they had to give some feedback to me. And then uh, the second part just being um, to give yourself lots of time when you're writing it, because that's always important. You never want to leave it to the last minute. So you can write it and then maybe think some more about it and then come back to it because um, the best writing is rewritten and rewritten again. <laughs> so that's a, that's a really important part of the application. And so in just making sure that you uh, adhere to the guidelines. So if there's a specific word count, I consider just making sure that you follow those guidelines specifically when you're completing that application. Yeah, I agree. Tips, Hannah. Um, I would say step one is really introspection. I, I know it sounds like super basic, but you really need to know who you are as a person to be able to sell it to the admission committee. Um, that would be like my number one thing. I also think it's important to um, really dive deep into your answers. I, I, I like I have read uh, applications in the past and like you can't make statements that are like, I like wanna help people or I like healthcare or I like medicine because like, oh yeah, well, you know, the 2000 other applicants all, also all love that stuff. So. It were like the you have to think about the person reading it. If the person reads this, it's gonna be like, well, this is really boring because everyone wants to do this. So that's why the introspection part is really important is that you have to know who you are to be able to write about it and sell it to the people who are gonna be reading it. So that's really important. Um, I think it's what I've often seen in uh, application as well is that people kind of stay superficial. So they'll say, um, for example, they'll name a strength, they'll give an example, and then they'll move on to the next question. So the person is kind of left saying like, okay, well, cool like an example but what does this mean and how does it reflect back to being a PA student or being a PA in general so um, I talked about this in the past like on my Instagram where I kind of use like the what how so what approach so it really kind of like how you write a thesis statement you use that approach in answering your question so then you'll have that example you'll describe it but then you'll say why that it matters so if you say I don't know I, I just said not to say this. If you say like, I like medicine, then you can say like, why is that important? Well, because I want to have an important role as a PA in Canada to blah, 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 blah. And you really explain. So you really expand on that. So I think that's really important um, on top of like the basic stuff, like respecting word count. Uh, I have also seen like people go to like, if it's 250 and they go to like 275, that basically just tells the person you're not able to respect guidelines, which is not a good start when you're trying to impress a panel. So what is the format of University of Toronto's PA school interviews this year? So um, we did, both of us signed a non-disclosure agreement when we completed our applications. So we're not able to share really much about the process of the interview. Um, 
for the questions we were asked, but just in general, ours was an online format because of the pandemic. And so uh, I think I would assume again this year it's online. Uh, so I think the main aspect to having an online interview as opposed to in person is there's some great opportunity to prepare a little bit differently because you can anticipate your um, testing environment. I say testing, but I mean interview, um, that kind of environment that you're going to be in. And I think that can be really comforting for some people. It might be uncomfortable for others, but there are some really some key aspects that you can make sure that are set in place to make sure that you're going to have a successful interview. So what I mean by that is making sure ahead of time that you have a strong Wi-Fi connection. So not an hour before your appointment, uh, for your interview time, you're looking to make sure your interview is strong. It means in advance, you're looking at your interview internet connectivity speed, uh, making sure that that's strong, also making sure in your environment uh, is one that's appropriate for an interview and your attire as well. So I think those are all important aspects to consider as you're preparing for an online setting. And then an additional um, aspect to consider is since it is going to be online that you can prepare getting comfortable talking in front of a screen. I think now, because many of us are doing school online, we're getting more and more comfortable talking to little circles on the top of our screen as opposed to a face. Um, but I think that that's an important part to get uh, comfortable with if that's something that you're you're not a huge fan of. So you can practice uh, in a similar environment to what is going to be the actual interview. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think there's like plus and minuses for the fact that it's an online format. Um, like for me, I really like that. I, you know, I was like kind of said, in my own environment. I wasn't, you know, stress trying to find the street because I don't know Toronto I didn't have to like take the transit and be like all sweaty because I'm running all over the place I was in my home so it was really uh, I felt more confident in that um, I was able to have my routine in the morning so that was really nice and like Hannah said it's kind of weird at first when we're talking to a screen and this is something that I always tell uh, people that you need to practice you need to record yourself practicing because you won't like you know when you have a, a normal interview in person you might get feedback or the person might like nod or whatever but if you're recording yourself, it's just you, it's just you and yourself. So you have to get comfortable with that uh, and kind of having to know how, what's, it, what's your posture. If you're like this, like that doesn't work. If you're like super close or super far, that doesn't work. So it's really um, kind of adapting to the online world. And I think it's something also that will apply to PA school. <laughs> you're doing it all online, but also, you know, patient communications. And I don't know if you have like um, interactions with patients online, but a lot of it now is telehealth. So it's something that you can learn now, but apply it later as well. So how did you practice for the MMI knowing that it was online? So I think the big thing about practicing for the MMI is just MMI is just that practicing, like you, something you can prepare for and you can put time into to practice in advance instead of just weighing the questions on the day of. So first of all, understanding what is an MMI, what does the format like and what are the different varieties of questions that you could be asked? So just understanding the variety of questions instead of being concerned with having practiced every single question in the book because that's exhaustive and probably not possible. Just being under uh, aware of the variety and how you can respond to different questions, how you can think critically to be able to respond to a question and have a formula, not uh, a kind of a structured way of responding. I'm hesitant to say formulaic because obviously you want to avoid being robotic in response as you want to be authentic. But at the same time, you want to be structured in your thoughts. You want to show that you can think through a response when you're giving it. And I think that really comes through practice. I think it's more natural for some people as opposed to others. So it might take a little bit more time. Maybe you have to practice writing out your response to, to kind of get through how you can structure a response well to feel confident, or maybe you just need to practice saying it out loud a bunch of times. There's so many different ways that you can practice. And I think it depends on where you've identified that your weaknesses are. There's also lots of written um, books that you can look up, online web pages. There's so many different available resources, some free, some paid. So I think spending some time, first of all, understanding what the MMI is and the variety of questions you could be asked. Then the second thing is maybe choosing a few resources that you think may be helpful for you specifically. Uh, so if you have issues or difficulty, um, maybe having uh, answers to ethical based questions, then maybe it's exploring some more resources regarding that. Um, and then maybe if it's a more traditional question or whatever the type of question, if you notice that you have more struggle with that, maybe that's a resource that you dig deeper in. 
So uh, some resources available. And then the third piece, which is something that we've stressed so much in this um, online Q&A already is, is the introspection piece. So it's the thinking through what you would like to offer offer and what you'd like your interviewer to come away with at the end. So what are some pieces that you just want to leave on the table that you've said? So for me, um, I found it most helpful to create an Excel uh, spreadsheet um, coming up with some of the fundamental uh, activities, work, uh, personal life experiences that I had that I thought may be helpful in the MMI. So I created an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I made that available on my Instagram. If you're interested, you can download it through the link in my bio. Um, that's just uh, me because I'm a very uh, organized in the way that I think. So I found that really helpful to prepare. Um, and then also uh, practice when I did practice questions, I practiced um, with my computer because I did know it was online. And then I went through my responses with family members and we looked at them together. We thought, what are some things that I could work on? Was they saying, um, too many times or Maybe was I uh, not communicating what I initially hoped that I would to my interviewer. So those were some feedbacks that I gave to myself and then things I could work on as I continued through the MMI. And just thinking that you want to share it as much as you you can with the interviewer. So diversity, if possible. And I think the best way to do that is to have already done some introspection. So you have some things that you can um, rely on at your fingertips to the interviewer, as opposed to having to think in the moment, um, which might be a bit trickier, especially with the stress of the interview. Um, And then I'll just share one more piece of something that I found helpful as I prepare for the MMI. It just has to do with physical activity. So I did a lot of yoga in preparation for the MMI because I was quite stressed as I prepared. And so um, actually, when I got my acceptance to U of T, I was in the middle of a yoga session. So it was something that I found really helpful. I think just anything you can use for stress relief, physical activity is a great um, outlet, but it's really important when you're preparing for such such a stressful interview. Yeah, I would say like, I know like a lot of people are in that phase right now where they're, they are preparing because it's coming up. It is super stressful. Oh my God. I'm so happy I'm past that phase. Hannah, I'm sure you are too. Um, but uh, you'll get through it. Uh, you just need to, to prepare. I would say that, like Hannah said, like her, you know, she's saying, I have to be careful with my arms, for example. So kind of, again, have that introspection and say like, oh, what is something that I might do that might penalize me on my interview? So for me, I'm Francophone and I speak super fast. Like I know even now I'm talking fast. That's just who I am. Um, and I knew that in an interview, I couldn't, like I, I had to, tone it down a bit I had to slow down so when I would record myself on my own I would be like slow down slow down so then I would always tell my desk to slow down I would listen to it I'm like oh my god that's still too fast so it really helped me kind of have that you know feedback to be like okay that's too fast so this is the speed I need to talk to during my interview so having that practice really helped um of course do your research uh I know like oftentimes we kind of recommend doing right but it's like is like this big it's really big so uh, you have to start in advance if you only have two weeks you probably won't have time to go through it so just read up online you know stay up to date with current events I personally what I did is I went on to Twitter and just followed a bunch of health journalists um, like Andre Picard for example is really great he works for uh, Globe and Mail and he always talks about like right now it's huge on COVID and he'll share like tons of articles that he wrote or colleagues wrote and oftentimes it's like ethics based um so that's that was really helpful for me and then the biggest point was the fact that i um connected with two other applicants uh, via the facebook page and i see that people are doing that now this year too so i'm really happy people are doing that um so i found two people that, that also had interviews one had an interview at mac and one had an interview at u of t and i had an interview at both so what we did is that we every night for the last like two three weeks before the interview or almost every night we'd connect on um, Facebook video or whatever. And we would just go through cases and it would actually be super stressful at first because we didn't know each other. So it's kind of weird practicing with people you don't know, but I think that was like the, it's the stress you're kind of going to have for the interview was actually really good. And then we just take turns in answering a various type of questions. We do like the BMO Like BMO has like a 200 like MMI question list. That's really amazing. So we'd kind of go through them and give each other feedback, like what we should improve, what was good. And when we got the, to the interview, we kind of felt prepared and the, like you were all, all three of us were accepted. So it was really helpful for us anyways to practice with other people. And again, like, yes, they're, they're your comp- competition, but you know, it, it's always good to help each other out. So what exactly does it mean to be waitlisted? And should these candidates still be preparing for the MMI? 
Yeah, so waitlisting, it looks a little bit different, I think, than what you would think when you're in person and you're maybe even being invited to the interview to stand by if somebody doesn't show up to that interview. But for waitlisting, it's a similar idea. If somebody gives up their spot, then there's an opportunity for you to interview. So I would say it's of utmost importance to still prepare as if you have an interview because there's the opportunity for you to still interview. And I, I know it could be a little bit disheartening, not knowing for sure if you're going to interview or not, but I would say it's only to your benefit that year, if not the next year applying as well, that you're preparing for that interview as if you had an interview. Because um, I think the skills that you acquire as you prepare for the MMI in advance, practicing, uh, giving your answers, uh, thinking about how you can structure uh, your responses and also how you can kind of cut out those uh, phrases, you know, the MC mentioned or adjust your speaking tone. Those aren't things that are learned overnight. And if you find out just maybe a day before your interview that you're now interviewing and you're kind of cramming, uh, I think that will really do yourself a disservice. So prepare as if you have an interview. I hope that you get an interview. And if not, um, you'll be prepared for the, for the next year uh, or for whatever interview you have in the future. Yeah, I just want to add, I saw a really cool quote uh, recently on Instagram. It, was, it said something like, um, you know, you don't start from scratch, you, st you start from experience. So I think in this context, it's kind of a good thing to think about. Like, if you're waitlisted and you practice, you might not apply it right away, but who knows, you might apply it in the future. And again, if you're talking about, you know, practicing your tone, your speed, this is things, even if you don't reapply next year, it's going to be things you can use in your everyday life. Next, we're going to move on to part four, which is reapplying to PA school. So we got a couple of people writing in saying that they didn't get an interview invite or even waitlisted for interviews. How can these candidates strengthen their application for the next cycle? Um, just in my, my experience um, uh, in applying, because I when I initially applied to medical school and I didn't get in, I was thinking about reapplying to medical school again before I applied to PA school. And when I was thinking about reapplying, um, or when you're reapplying to any program, I kind of thing, the things you want to think about are what are the different pieces of the application? So GPA, supplemental, interview, or if you got to the interview stage, then you had already completed the supplemental. What are the different aspects? And then what are some things you think you did well? And what are some things you think you did better? And what are some things that you can accomplish within one year's time that's achievable and uh, that would help strengthen the application? So there's obviously maybe you have a, a whole list of things you want to do, but be reasonable with yourself. Maybe pick a couple things that you really want to work on uh, and maybe even consider if you did interview with some practice interviewing with somebody uh, asking them, what are, what are some feedback that you could provide me with? It's really hard because you don't really get feedback on your application. So it's really up to you to do the work to consider what are some things that I could do to strengthen myself as a candidate. I would say like, first of all, like, it might be really, really hard. And I, I know because I've, I've been through it. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we're talking about this later on. Uh, Anne, but anyways, I'll touch on it right now. Um, so yeah, it was really hard because I had put all that effort and I, I know that everyone does, right? You, you spend so much time writing your application, uh, hours and hours you edit and you have all these hopes and you kind of see yourself as you know, a PA student and one day as a PA, it's like this big thing. So of course, when you get the refusal, it can be really, really hard. Like for me, I like my husband said he never saw me cry as much as for that day where I got a refusal. And I, for me personally, I actually had to take a little step back from everything related to PA because it was just, it was just too much, and I was just too emotional. And it's okay. Like it, you don't have to make a decision about your life, you know, right now. You can take a little, like a few weeks. Or I took a few months before deciding I wanted to reapply. So and don't worry about it, and that's fine. Um, I have a lot of people message me on, on Instagram and say like, oh, like I, I thought my application was super good. I don't understand like what happened. And I, I, I posted about this on my Instagram recently saying like, it's, it's not necessarily an attack against you personally. It, it just might be that, you know, other applicants just, you know, shine, shown a little bit more on other things that made them stand out. It's not because you're not good enough. Um, so again, try to, it's really hard because I know like for myself, I blame myself and kind of was really hard on myself, but try not to do that and see this really is an opportunity to grow. Like, yes, it kind of sucks to have to start over. Oh yeah, not starting over, starting from experience um, and going through that process again. Like, yes, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. It's some money and it kind of sucks, but 
it really like for me made me experience sides that I didn't know existed. It, like the perseverance, like keep pushing and see like really, again, evaluating yourself. Like I reread my application, my supplemental. And I was like, I was so sure the first time I applied, I was like, this is really strong. And I read it again, like a year after I'm like, wow, it actually it really sucks. <laughs> it didn't suck, but it wasn't really as, it wasn't as strong as I thought it was. So really like take the time off from walking away maybe now and go back to it afterwards and really take the time to go through it um, and see like, okay, what can you improve? Uh, you can even ask some family members. Maybe you have a healthcare provider that you work with. Um, it's always good to have that, that, you know, that point of view as well. So ask that person, like, do you mind taking a minute just to read through and maybe give me some advice um, at introspect? And, you know, if you, for example, again, think about the, the you know, being well-rounded, if you only had, like for me, I only had two years of undergrads. So I was like, that's probably one point that was weak for me. The fact that I only had two years undergrad, so I had to keep going. And I really got my credits up to three years. Um, if you only have, you know, indirect patient care, are you able to get something that's more direct patient care? Um, you know, just try to figure out what aspect. There's so many aspects. There's GPA, you know, healthcare experience, volunteer experience. There's so many things you can work on. So try not to look at uh, tunnel vision. Don't look at only one thing, but see globally what you can do to be um, a better applicant. And like, don't be shy to reach out and, you know, ask for help if you need that. So how many, um, how much time did you take, you said, to process the, the result? And for those that are like, like in it right now, completely devastated or unsure, like what advice would you have for them at this time? Um, I took a lot of time and I actually, I remember I messaged you Anne because uh, we, were, we were talking a bit when I was in my application process and um, it's crazy. I still remember exactly when I found out that I, I was in, I was at the gym and I came home, I just started crying. I really needed to take a full break like for several months. So I had, I had my Instagram account back then as well. I just removed it from my phone. I was like, I don't want to know anything about this. I messaged Anne. I'm like, Anne, you won't hear from me for a while. I need to process. I wasn't even sure I was going to reapply actually, even though PA was like the thing I really wanted. It hurt. It hurt so much that I wasn't sure if I wanted to go through that again a second time, if ever that happened. So I actually needed a few months to not think about it, to be like, okay, like I'm able to go through this again, and this is really what I want. And I'm not going to focus on the fact that I might get hurt again. I'm going to focus on how can I rock this and how can I become a better applicant. So I would say, take the time. Don't worry. Don't be too hard on yourself. Um, really do things that you know, make you feel better. If it can be like spending time with a loved one, it might be harder in COVID times. But, um, you know, if you like, uh, Hannah mentioned yoga, exercising, uh, really do things that make you feel good, like, cause, and you need to kind of disconnect from the negative feelings of, um, you know, not being accepted. And once you're past that, that hump, and you're ready again, then sit down, look at your, your application, um, really, like, take out all the aspects, okay, like, what was my GPA? Do I think that's competitive enough? What's hard with GPA, though, and we kind of all know this, it's a really slow process. So if you have a lower GPA, it's not necessarily like one class and you're done. But um, what I often recommend, if it, if it is GPA, maybe reach out. If you're still in university, reach out to the academic advisor at your university. Oftentimes you can have sit, like have a sit down with you and say like, okay, like if you have, if you take this amount of classes and you get this grade, this is how much you can improve your GPA. So then you have a better idea of you know, what you can do to get that, you know, in a, in a better place, and if it's even possible. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, again, if you if you're lacking experience, go out there. Um, people often say, like, what can I do? Like, really don't be shy, like message everyone, you know, say, hey, if you know someone that's looking for, you know, a position in healthcare, I'm your person, write it on your Facebook, look at all the websites, it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of effort. But for me, it paid off, because here I am today. That's super cheesy. Sorry, but it's true. <laughs> no, that's a very good point. And um, just to clarify, when you applied the first time, it was uh, you, you, you applied to two schools, correct? I only applied to U of T mm -hmm. uh, my first year. So um, actually, it was from your advice. I remember you said that at one point, like, um, it's good to have like, it's good to aim as, as far as we can, like, in Canada, we only have three programs. So we're not like in the US, they oftentimes apply to like 20 schools at the same time. We don't have that option here. But even though my mind was really set on U of T, I knew that if I applied to Mac, like it wouldn't be my first choice. Like I wouldn't really want to move, um, you know, to go to McMaster and have in-person classes. But what I really wanted is to be a PA. So I was like, I'm ready to go through that if that's what, you know, will get me there. So I applied to both schools and it really helped because I got, I remember I got my, um, interview invite from Mac first and just having that was like like because I didn't even get an interview invite the first time so just to get an invite from Mac first was like a huge pick me up 
and then uh, U of T as well. So it's like just confident base that was enough just to have those two. And it was also really nice to have both experiences like in terms of interview, they're a little bit different. So that was really nice as well. And what do you think was so different about your application attempt the second time versus the first time that secured you invites at two schools? Credits from schools. I went from being two years to three years. I think that was a big point. Um, you know, I remember attending, like I attended a Mac had like, you know, those online sessions. I forget how they're called, but they kind of give the information sessions. And I, I remember they were saying that it's kind of hard to get accepted into P school with an uh, ongoing uh, degree for our class in U of T. I think we're five or six maybe who have ongoing degrees. So most of the times it's people who have completed their degree. So I knew that I really had to do the most I could during that one year. So I took as many classes as I could. I worked really hard to maintain that, that GPA fairly high. Um, and then I was like, well, what, what's an issue with me? I was like, it's not a healthcare experience. I have 15,000 hours. That's not a problem. I was like, well, maybe it's my sub app. So again, I, I opened it up. And like I said, I read it. And I was like, oh, wow. I thought this was strong last year. And I, I basically scrapped it completely. Um, I used maybe two, three sentences from it. Um, but I decided to write it completely from scratch. Um, and really, I, even, I think I even used part of my experience and the fact that I was, you know, I got a turn down the first time and how I grew that second time and because it did change me as a person so I figured it was worth talking about in my application so yeah um school and re uh, rethinking my application and then prepping for the interview because I didn't have a chance to do that the first time around again so you said I think really just going through some self-reflection uh is really great because it can help uh not only strengthen your application the second time around but just give you some reflection on what you want out of your career and that'll help really guide your path regardless and really strengthen your responses and i i think just being also uh gracious with yourself and allowing yourself to experience all the emotions i think is so important because applications to uh, programs and hearing back is just also stressful and, and you've been working towards something for so long. So I think it's just important to make sure that you're really gracious with yourself. Any parting words or words of advice to students that are pursuing the PA profession? I wish you all the best of luck. I know it's very challenging. The whole process can be very taxing and tolling because it is pretty much a year of working through things. I know the applications kind of open up in the late fall, um, early winter, and you start the initial application process and you work through and you're starting to prepare for interviews. So I kind of said when I, and I was trying to do this while I was going through the application process, you kind of have to pretend when you're applying that the application and getting into PA school is kind of like the only thing that you want. It's really what you're working towards and it's your main focus. But in real life, you have to kind of put it off to the side at some point too. You have to make sure that you're still taking care of yourself, that you're still investing in what you're doing in your current work, so that you're investing in your relationships. So while you're kind of in one aspect, pretending like it's your main focus and what you're working towards and you want to convey that to your um, the person who's reading your application or interacting with you, um, on the other hand, you want to make sure that you you are well balanced and so you are able to take some time away from that because I think um, being well rounded and, and going through that application process really helps you stay grounded, manage your stress, um, also helps you to continue on that um, path of self growth and development and understanding what you want out of your career. Uh, so I think those are it's just important to strike that balance throughout uh, the whole process. So yeah, just make sure to take some time to do stress management in whatever way is effective for you. Um, and just know that PA school is so competitive. There's so few seats. And just because you don't get in PA school the first time does not mean you wouldn't make an excellent PA. Um, it's just, it's so challenging when there's so many students applying. Um, I, I heard this for medical school, but I, I would imagine it's a similar idea with PA school. Like for every student that's admitted, there's other students who are also qualified. So just know that, you have lots to offer, make sure that you show that um, and try not to compare yourself with others because your journey is going to look different. Um, know your self-worth and value and I wish you all the best. And if you ever want to, uh, if you have any questions or you want to reach out, feel free to do that. Again, like what's really important is that you really understand what the PA profession, what it means, especially in Canada, just because it is a fairly newer profession. Um, understand what it can bring to Canadian healthcare. I think one point that we could focus on is really the fact now we're in a pandemic, like think about how can PAs maybe impact healthcare and, you know, impact patient care um, 
and and do you want to be a part of that? It's you know it's it's really exciting. I, I for me like PA is the perfect job. Um, like Hannah said earlier, it's not really like a stepping stone. You're not going to be like, oh, I'm going to do PA then to go on to med school. Like, no, like PA is the end game. And we're like, everyone in our class is so passionate about the profession. And we're all super excited. You know, the different backgrounds, again, like really be proud of where you come from and make sure that you show that, you know, who you are and what, what you can bring to the program, what you can bring to the profession. Like you're going to one day be Anne's colleague and my colleague and, <laughs> and Hannah's colleague. So, you know, focus on that. Um, you know, in terms of refusals, I really know how it feels and it's really tough. So, you know, don't worry. It happens. I kind of said, like, you're not alone. It feels super alone. I remember I felt like the biggest loser in the world. And I felt like I was the only person that they turned down, even though, you know, most people, I think what it's like 30% are accepted into, no, wait, that doesn't work. No, it's 30 seats. And it's like 3%, 3% is accepted in the PA school. So, you're not the only one going through that, you know, that hardship and like the heartbreak and everything. So um, just know that it happens. And, it, and that's life too. Like, you, you know, you might apply for a job that you really want and you might not get it. It doesn't mean that you are not qualified for that job. It just means that at that specific time, it just wasn't meant, meant to be. And just know that one year goes by really quickly. Like I, I, I couldn't believe when I was like, yeah, I'm ready to do this again. I was like, wow, okay. Like it's here already. And even like Hannah and I, I can't believe we finished our second semester already. And then we're, we're almost done first year. It, it feels like I just finished the application process like a week ago. So, you know, if you did get that refusal, don't worry. The next round will come right away and, and, you, and you'll rock it. Like just if you're really sure that's what you want, then make that effort to improve your application and, and don't give up. And uh, yeah, like Hannah said, I, I'm always really happy to help. Um, you guys often message me on Instagram. So go ahead and I'm always happy to answer your questions if ever you have any. Thank you, MC and Hannah for coming on to the live today. So many words of wisdom as well as really helpful advice from people that have actually been through the PA school process and our, sorry, application process and are now in PA school.